Mansfield today on a Thursday, and that means it's time to travel once again, courtesy of our friends at Flight Centre. Um, we've been looking at these various issues from all sorts of angles, um, and it occurred to us that we've really been looking at all the issues. We're talking about the red list, for example, in the UK. We're talking about flights that are coming into and leaving South Africa. The, the hospitality industry and the state it's in, the tourism industry as a whole. But we, we've all been looking at them from a South African and internal perspective. So we thought, let's climb out of the box and go and speak to an expat. So we head off to the south of France, and that's where we find Jenny Baxter. Jenny, thank you very much for joining us on Mansfield today. Jenny is um, the founder... You. You're the founder of um, SAPeople.com, is that correct? That's correct. Hi, Jeremy. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Uh, by, the, by the way, I got a fright when we first crossed to you. I thought you, you weren't ready for us because I love your microphone. It looks like a normal <laughs> telephone. I, th I thought you were on a phone call to somebody else, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. You know, my daughter gave it to me and I just love it. So I think it's absolutely gorgeous. I think it's absolutely gorgeous. Your daughter's got taste. Um, Jenny, from an expat point of view, because you interact with a lot of expats, what is, what, what is the feeling across UK and in Europe and, and the, pe the people you interface with? Well, the, the people that we deal with from the UK are devastated. The, you know, the red list has had um, emotional, mental health um, repercussions. But, you know, people have lost their parents during these last, you know, 12 months to 18 months um, and, and can't even be with their loved ones, can't even give them hugs back in South Africa, let alone go to the funerals. Um, uh, you know, have missed out on seeing grandparents, grandchildren, etc. Um, it's just too costly for them. You know, if they go to South Africa, they and they do have a British passport, they can get back into England, but they can't quarantine at home. They have to do the 10 days at £2,000. So we have had many devastated people, and we've done a lot to um, try and and raise the issue with the UK Parliament. There's now 36,000 signatures on the petition, but it needs 100,000 for the Parliament to actually um, uh, debate it in Parliament. Um, we've also got a letter that people in England, you know, and their British friends can, can copy and paste and send to their local MPs because if enough MPs raise it, it can also get raised in Parliament. Um, so, so everybody, you know, and we're very grateful to Carte Blanche last night doing a show on it. So, you know, everybody's trying to raise as much awareness as possible. Here in Europe, um, we have a lot of South Africans, particularly where I live. I'm in Antibes, and um, we have lots of South Africans coming to work on the boats. Uh, we, we're a lot less strict here, even though South Africa is on France's red list, um, because yeah uh, I won't even go there but um but but you can come in so if you're fully vaccinated you can totally come into to France um but this last week I've had a South African staying with me who was not vaccinated at all but because he had an Italian passport I think um he was allowed to come in you're meant to do a 10-day quarantine in France if you're not vaccinated but we haven't seen anybody do it. And we seriously know, I don't know, over 50 South Africans who are here in Antibes and they're coming and going all the time. So, so it's, a, it's pretty, pretty chill in Europe, but, but England is a problem. And I don't know if you know, but France has had the same problem because uh, and, until just a few weeks ago, you know, we also had to quarantine when we went to England and, and it was the same craziness um, where we were being penalized because of some people having the beta variant in, in Reunion, which is a, a French um, overseas region. Mm. So, you know, it was insane. It was wrong. There were other countries with more beta. So I just do want to say to South Africans in SA 
that this isn't racist. It's just scientists in England who are not getting all their research data um, accurately, you know. And, and, and even in South Africa, you know, to be fair to England, last week, it was on the 16th of September that South Africa announced it had not seen the beta variant for two weeks. But the next day, the UK announced that South Africa was remaining on the red list. So I think that the data just hadn't quite got to them yet. And, and I know that they are meeting again very soon. And, you know, with all this talk of it, I think, I think there's hope, you know, that South Africa will be taken off the red list. But, well, I believe, but I, believe, I, I believe that Naledi Pando this week is going over to the UK with a group of scientists to specifically sit down with British scientists and say, here's our data, where's your data, and why aren't we finding any sort of uh, way to work together? Exactly, exactly. I mean, the whole beta variant thing, I definitely think the UK has, has been out of date. And the UK, you know, to understand, the UK is very scared of the beta variant. That is the problem. So it's not about Delta or cases as much as it is the beta variant. So I think that once you know, the minister and the scientists can show that actually it's now been almost a month with no beta variant in South Africa. You know, that's fantastic. And then, of course, the other thing is um, the vaccination rate. You know, I, I, I think South Africa right now is only sitting on 14.6%. Mm -hmm. So, you know, South Africans got upset that Turkey was taken off, but, you know, Turkey's percentage is far higher and here in France, I think we're at 65%. So, so yeah. if, if South Africans could just ramp up the vaccination, which, you know, I know President Ramaphosa is doing all he can, but... Yeah. Um, the, the whole um, issue with Brexit must have made it a lot easier in retrospect for once COVID broke out, for movement within the European Union to be facil facilitated a lot quicker, especially for expats from other countries? Well, well, no, Brexit made it a bit harder for us because before okay. England was part of the EU, so we all did things together. And then with Brexit, um, England really, you know, England and Europe really sort of fell out with each other, sort of really bad lovers. And, um, and so we've had a lot of problems and, and um, but now it's kind of fixed in, in France, for instance, and in most European countries, if you're like me, you know, a South African, but with a, a British passport, um, we get a, a, a carte de séjour which lasts for 10 years, and then we have to reapply before 10 years is up. So, so they have facilitated that. But, you know, because we broke, you know, England broke up with Europe, we have not been able to travel to England. And in fact, we have, you know, English friends who are only now this week coming to France. So it's that recent for us. It's only in the last three weeks or so that it's become a bit easier for us to travel you know, to England and for English people to travel back after being in France. I know that you guys have been following a story about um, SA expats possibly losing their citizenship. Um, what, what, what's going on there? Yeah, correct. And it's actually just been exacerbated by the whole pandemic. Um, so what happened is in 1995, the government changed the law and said that if you want to get a foreign citizenship, you have to ask for permission first. And I'm not quite sure why, because if you ask, they always say yes. So it's, you know, it feels like it's a money making exercise because you have to pay for this. It's called a letter of retention. And, um, 
and obviously many, many expats who had been overseas for quite a while had no idea, and, and even new expats had no idea. And it took at least 15 years before people started realizing, you know, when they went to renew their passports or things like that, and they were told, oh, sorry, you're not a South African anymore because you got Australian, you know, an Australian passport without asking South Africa first, et cetera. Uh, during the pandemic, um, Home Affairs in South Africa closed the department that does the letters of retention. So for the last 18 months, you know, until very recently, you couldn't even get the letter of retention. So many people, even more people have now lost their South African citizenship. So, so the DA and the DA abroad, because you know, so many people in England were contacting them, contacting us at SA People, devastated. And, and I think it's devastating for South Africa too, because, you know, expats who have a South African passport can easily go back home, can easily spend lots of dollars or pounds and, um, and invest in South Africa, you know, so I think it's good to keep them as South Africans. Um, so, so the DA took it to court. Unfortunately, the court was convinced by the government that, um, that these South Africans deliberately lost their citizenship, which is an absolute untruth. You know, I, I, I know people, an Indian couple in New Zealand who, who fought against apartheid and, you know, now cannot believe that the very same government they fought for uh, won't let them be South African citizens anymore. So, you know, it's across the board, it's, it's everywhere. And um, so, so the DA uh, abroad confirmed to me yesterday that they are going to take it to the Senior Court of Appeal. Um, so, you know, hold thumbs for that. And, and I really? don't know, Jeremy, if, sorry. No, no, go ahead. I, I just wanted to mention just, just how much money South Africans bring um, to South Africa. Like, you know, there's so many South Africans in the UK who are part of the 440,000 visitors from the UK that visit South Africa normally each year. They yeah. spend on average 30,000 during their visit back in South Africa. And um, I think, I think uh, Saxa was saying that right now, without the UK visitors, which includes many South African expats, that's 1.5 million rand that, that South Africa is losing each day. Yeah. So, uh, sorry, it's 1.5 million tourist workers who are missing out on work. And it is 26 million rand that is being lost every day. Yeah. Yeah, they're scary figures. They absolutely are. And we've, as I said, you know, we've been speaking to people um, <clears throat> like Satsa, like uh, people from Soho Sun, Sun International, from... Western the, Cape. The Western Cape government is doing a lot. Yeah. It's, it's just a question of... It, it doesn't seem like there's a cohesive and comprehensive uh, um, plan that's being put together behind this, this, this crisis that we fit facing in the tourism industry. But um, Jenny, thank you very much for giving us an, an expat's view. If there are pe people who would like to sign that petition, I take it they can find it on sapeople.com. Correct, correct. Okay, and we urge you to go ahead. I know I've already signed it. Um, sapeople.com and uh, go and sign that petition so we can get to 100,000 uh, signatures and that that can then be forwarded to um, the House of Commons and can go up for debate in the House of Commons. Thank you very much to Jenny Baxter. Now, during the lockdown, there's been one company that hasn't locked down at all in the tourism industry. They've been working seven uh, days a week, uh, 20, 24 hours a day. Um, we picked this piece up. Just take a look at what's been happening. I've never seen anything like this before in my aviation career. At the moment, we have uh, about 80% of the fleet in the parking mode. There's a lot of things we have to do. We have to cover the engine intake and exhaust to protect internal workings from the environment, such as the sand and dust. The sensors all have to be blocked. Lots of other items, such as disconnecting batteries to preserve the aircraft.
we have engineers working around the clock maintaining the aircraft. They're a very intricate, uh, complex piece of machinery. It's not like parking a car, we have to keep them maintained. So we will be running engines, powering up the aircraft, checking the flight controls while these aircraft are in the parking mode. In the hangars, we have uh, aircraft undergoing heavy maintenance checks. We're also doing a cabin refresh. All the passenger seats will be checked individually. So far, we've replaced 10,000 seat covers and backrest covers. All the carpets are being shampooed and washed. We have about 200 people per shift working just on this. We worked closely with fleet management to advance some of the maintenance checks that are due later, whether it's a 777 or a 787 or a 380. We're taking every opportunity during this time, including product improvement. We do this maintenance to the best standard, best quality. We're working 24 hours a day, seven days a week. When our aircraft go back into service, for the passenger, it'll be like getting onto a brand new aircraft. Once the world starts returning to normal, we will be ready.